Okay, this video is a continuation from the uh, last PowerPoint on basic electrical. So if you haven't watched that video first, uh, then you need to watch that before you do this one. Uh, so this is going to be advanced electrical. Anybody know what this is? Why is this one here? Anybody ever seen this before? No? Okay. All right, what we're going to learn in this lesson, the big three definitions that we went over in the last one a little bit, Ohm's law, voltage drop, resistors, diodes, transistors, current draw, and go over a little war story study that uh, I ran into. All right, so the big three I'm talking about, and we talked about this last time, is voltage, current, resistance. Remember that. Voltage is a force that causes the electron to flow to, through a conductor. It is electrical pressure how hard it's pushing, okay? Current, which is amps, continuous movement of electrons through a conductor, this is how much voltage actually goes through, okay? Resistance is the opposition of force, voltage, measured in ohms. There are two ways I can think about resistance. The first way is, is it's like a thief stealing the voltage away, okay? The second way is, when thing of resistance, think about your kitchen sink. With the valve closed, there is no water flow, so you have max resistance. If the valve is halfway open, some water will flow, so you have some resistance. If the water valve is all the way open, water is running out fast, so you have little resistance. Does that make sense? Uh, here's another thing for you here. Let's say you take a bucket and fill it full of water. You drill one hole in the bucket. That hole represents 10 ohms. So you have 10 ohms of resistance. But what happens if you drill another hole of equal size? What will your resistance reading be then? Water's coming out of here. Okay, that's 10 ohms. Then you drill an ohm the same size. What's gonna happen? Wouldn't it be less resistance? Yeah, Wouldn't make sense? Mm -hmm. So how much less? Yeah. Does that make sense? That little portion just to do a little portion thing. That's, that's uh just it never presents ohms. Alright, Ohm's law, the relationship between current, resistance, and voltage in any electrical circuit. E equals I times R, I equals E divided by R, R equals E divided by I, okay? So this right here is the same thing as this. So E, that stands for voltage, okay? So let's say we have 12 volts. Let's say we know we have four ohms resistance, R is resistance. I is amps. They help you. What's the what's the your amps? How many amps you got in that circuit? What's twelve divided by four? That makes sense. See so if you go like this, put it times. Does that help you? What if you know you had twelve? 12 volts and 3 amps, your resistance would be 4. 4 times 3 is 12. Make sense? That's Ohm's law. Uh, I would say you're very rarely going to use this probably when diagnosing a vehicle, but you will run into this throughout your career in the automotive technology field. All right, so a diode is an electrical one-way check valve, a semiconductor that permits the flow of electrons in one direction only, and is used to convert AC voltage to DC voltage. A junction diode rectifies AC current from the alternator to the, into the DC current. Use an ohm meter to check it. If place the red lead of the ohm meter on the N side, the black lead on the P side, after you have recorded your measurements, what's your leads? You should only measure resistance in one direction. So, Alternating current 
AC current goes back and forth, right? Direct current goes in one direction. Does that make sense? So your alternator for your car actually produces AC current, alternating current. But because of a junction diode, it makes it to where it only goes in one direction and turns it to DC. You go with that? What happens when the diode fails? In an alternator, when a diode fails, the charging output of the alternator will be diminished. When a diode leaks AC current into a DC system, it picks up electrical noise, which will affect cars and computers. And it can also be the reason a battery will have an electrical drain. Let's say you have a vehicle and the battery dies. Let's say you don't start up for two days and the battery dies. You have to jump start every time, right? And well, now, on vehicles nowadays, it can be, you know, several things, Compute, any one of the computers on there, um, of course, a glove box light, you know, a little ashtray light, somebody leaving the dome light on. But if you have an older vehicle, I'd say like, you know, early 90s and before, uh, the first thing I would do when you're doing your uh, battery drain check, I would unplug the alternator and see if that doesn't take, see, I would test the alternator and see if that would be the cause. But that's about the only thing on there that can do it. Um, a rectifier bridge in an alternator consists of six diodes, two for each stator winding. Reverse bias diode will act as an insulator, blocking the flow of electricity in one direction. It will act as a protection device, protecting system components from voltage surge. Forward base diode, positive, uh, positive facing positive voltage. It will allow, it will act as a conductor, allowing electricity to flow through the circuit. And the Zenier diode only allows a certain amount of voltage through. If it was rated for 16 volts, only 16 volts would flow through the diode. It's used in instrument clusters a lot of times. All right, let's talk about the alternator, a little rectifier bridge. 12 volt battery. All right, so a 12 volt, volt battery, it has six cells in it. Six individual cells. Each cell produces approximately 2.1 volts for a total of 12.6 volts. So we often refer to the automotive cars as being a 12 volt system. Technically speaking, a fully charged battery shouldn't be 12 volts, it should be 12.6 volts. Burn that into your memory. You're gonna to need to know that, okay? CCA, the amount of amps a fully charged battery can deliver for 30 seconds at zero degrees Fahrenheit while maintaining 7.2 volts. Anybody ever seen that on a battery? Usually has like cranking amps or cold cranking amps. Ever seen it on the top. Next time you look at a battery, I'll show you out here in the shop. Uh, it's got, it should have a sticker on it that has CA and then CCA, cranking amps and cold cranking amps. When you have something uh, like a diesel truck, a lot of times you want something with a lot of cold cranking amps, like 850 cold cranking amps and you got two batteries in it. Uh, something for like my little Honda car, you know, that's probably like around like 450 or 500 cold cranking amps, somewhere in that neighborhood, okay? Reserve capacity, the number of minutes a battery can deliver 25 amps at 80 degrees Fahrenheit while maintaining 10.5 volts. We used to rebuild uh, starters a lot. Uh, for the most part, nowadays, you're just going to get it replaced. There are a few shops that will actually specialize in, in rebuilding starters and alternators, but they're getting to become more harder and harder to find. When you ever take it to a rebuild shop, I'm sure they do good work and all, but they can't necessarily guarantee it, can't give you a warranty. But when you go spend a few more bucks and get a brand new one, then you, know, you usually get a year or two warranty or something out of it. Um, I would stay away from the lifetime guaranteed stuff. I've never had any luck. Yeah, you may not have to pay for that starter ever again, but you gotta pay somebody to put it in and just, you know, I haven't had good luck. Voltage drop, connect the volt meter negatively to the battery connector on the starter, disable the fuel and fire the ignition, crank the, crank the engine. 
Touch the positive lead to the battery post positive. Record the reading. Release the voltmeter before you stop cranking the engine. And then we'll watch a video on how to do voltage drop tests a little later. I'm not going to do it right now. Tech tips. When doing a voltage drop test, current must be flowing. If you are testing a starting circuit, the engine must be turning over, but not running. Don't have it running. It's run, 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 okay? If you, are if you are testing a light, it must be switched on to test for voltage drop. Typically, on the starting circuit, about 0.5 to 1 volts of voltage drop is acceptable for the positive side. The negative side should be less. On a computer controlled circuit, voltage drop should be about 100 millivolts, so that's 0.1 volts or less. Always refer to vehicle specifications. Test voltage drop as close to the load as possible. That will ensure that you are testing the whole circuit. When measuring voltage across the load while current is flowing, it is normal to have a minute, a minute amount of voltage on one side. The load should eat up the volt, all the voltage, but it's not a perfect world, so you may have some residual voltage. All circuits have resistance. The question is how much is acceptable for that circuit to operate properly, okay? And whenever you check your resistance, you need to make sure you unplug each end of the wire and test it that way. Never leave them plugged up and never uh, try to check resistance on a wire that's got voltage flowing through it. It's going to throw your readings off. Starter current draw, you have to test at operating temperature, then disable the fuel slash fire. Fire means ignition, okay? Connect an ammeter in series with a negative cable, place a voltmeter across the battery terminals, crank the engine with all the loads off. The battery needs to be above 9.6 volts. And that's just a uh, common, you have to look up the exact specs for that, uh, for your particular vehicle, that's just kind of a generic, um, what do you, uh, generic, amperage you should have. If the readings are higher than spec, then you probably have a short circuit in the starter motor or engine mechanical problems. If the readings are lower than spec, the starter circuit resistance is too high. Charging system diamond repair, electromagnetic induction. When a conductor cuts across magnetic lines of force, voltage is induced in the wire. It's the basis for an alternator. To get the current to flow, either the wire may be moved in the stationary magnetic field, or the field may move while the wire remains stationary. Field. Light gauge conductive wires wound around soft iron pole shoes. Armature wires that cut through the field. What's happening and why? So let's say you have no or low charging. Broken or slipping belt that drives off later, that could cause it, right? Belt slipping or it's broken and that thing's not turning, it's not going to charge the vehicle. Makes sense. Defective voltage regulator, defective diodes, an open and alternator field circuit, excessive resistance or open in the wiring between the alternator and the battery, or maybe in sulfated battery plates. Overcharging, defective voltage regulator. Shorted field wire or internal short in the battery. You should notice that your light bulbs have a short lifespan and a battery that continuously needs water. Charging system voltage drop, usually caused by defective, incorrect, or corroded cable from the alternator to battery or poor ground connection. Something to think about the higher the number of the gauge wire, the smaller the wire is. So a 10 gauge wire. It's thicker than the 16 gauge wire. Remember that, okay? So if you have, when you're going to, let's say you go to do a wire repair, you need to make sure, like this is a 16 gauge wire, you need to make sure you need to get another 16 gauge wire on it and not something smaller or bigger, okay? If you measure resistance on a starter wire, you would see around one ohm of resistance. But what if you moved half the strands in that wire? What would the resistance be? Would it still start the car? Will it affect the amps? Okay, what have we got there in the shop? I'll show you more about that. One six inch piece of wire that shortens the ground and melts will fill the cab of vehicle up with poisonous smoke. Transistors, 
An electronic device produced by joining three sections of the semiconductor materials is used by switching or amplifying device. It has three parts, B, C, and E. Base, which is a gate, which is a switch, okay? A collector, battery source, and emitter, which is a load. Like a faucet, the water comes from the source, battery, and waits at the valve, which is a switch. When the valve opens, the water current can flow. Here's uh, what basically that transistor looks like when you see it on a wiring diagram. A transistor has to be open for current to flow. Transistors have to be open for current to flow. Think about a cattle gate. The gate is open and cattle can flow through. Two types of transistors, NPN or negative positive negative or PNP, positive negative positive. Okay? Soldering automotive wiring. Use Rosicor solder only because the center contains flux. Flux, it cleans the surface of the wire to be soldered. Most automotive solder is 60-40, 60% 10, 40% lead. 10, in the first, uh, 10 is the first number. It melts about 370 degrees Fahrenheit. Electrical soldering iron for an automotive should be around 45 watts. Be careful of using a 250 to 300 watt iron because it can melt the wire in insulation or introduce electrical current into the circuit. Never solder or repair airbag wiring harness or connectors. If it's broke, you should replace the whole wiring harness. Worked at a shop one time where the airbag wiring harness was uh, damaged on this um, on this Explorer, and they were looking for just getting the connector to go to the airbag. It was a passenger side airbag for the seatbelt, and I told him, "I said you're not going to you're." I don't think you ever find that. And if you do, I'm not going to install it. And they looked around, they couldn't find anybody to sell. So they actually had, we actually had to buy a whole wiring harness. And unfortunately, that wiring harness was big. It was pretty expensive. Had to take off, take out most of the interior, replace it. It was a big job. Uh, the reason is, is whenever you're putting in, let's say I were to put a get a connector, replace that damaged one, and I have to solder wires and you know all that stuff. Well, I may be changing resistance values. And then, you know, what if something were to happen and then you get into an accident and the airbag goes off or doesn't go off? You know, so just it's just too much liability. So don't ever repair an airbag wiring harness. You're just going to get a whole new one. So this is how to read a wiring diagram. Uh, this electrical diagram reads like this. Orange means it only has power when switched on. Red means it has power at all times. Rule, voltage and ground always stop at an open. Green means it has ground at all times. So we're going to go how to read a wiring diagram a little bit later. All right, wiring diagram symbols, okay? These are common symbols. Uh, you have to look up to see what each manufacturer has for their own. Uh, I want to say a lot of them are universal, but uh, somebody may have something different. They have a battery, little dot is either a connector or a splice, circuit breaker, a little squiggly line, that's a coal, that's pretty common. Diode, you'll see that a lot. That's a fuse. And this is hard to see, but this is a ground and it's got that, it's got lines underneath of it. But there's a lot of different. Um, Symbols out there to make the wiring diagram more legible, more readable, I guess. All right, war story study. So, worked at a shop, had a 2005 expedition with a 5.4 three valve V8, had 180 couple thousand miles. This is not that. This is not that one. This just looked like it. Uh, battery goes dead overnight. So what did I do? I had to verify the complaint. So I disconnected the negative battery cable and installed my digital, volt, my digital volt ohm meter between the negative battery cable and the battery. I switched my DVOM to amperage. Okay. What I found out was about every 39 seconds, there would be an eight and a half amp drain, which is huge. That would last for about 10 seconds. So, so every 39 seconds, I go one Mississippi, two Mississippi, three Mississippi, Every 39 seconds, I would get eight and a half amp drain for 10 seconds. After the 10 seconds, the drain would stop. 
would drop down to about 500 milliamps, and 500 milliamps is pretty much in the spec. So, if you look right here, whenever you're doing a parasitic drain test on a vehicle, you're good on the negative side. I got the negative cable unhooked, negative cable unhooked, and then I got my positive lead on the negative cable, my negative lead on the battery post terminal negative. And when I do that, that makes your voltmeter in line with the system. In other words, it is part of the electrical system now, okay? Which means that potentially, like if you were to open doors or turn on the lights or something like that, you can probably, you'll probably blow your fuses in your, uh, in your digital voltmeter. So you gotta be careful. Um, so here I am with the door open and I make sure to, I can't remember what I did on this one. I disabled the light inside, but I don't remember how I did. I don't remember if I switched the latch up or, you know, help if it was a button. I can't remember. I think it has a latch, but anyways. So I got the door open, 8.27 amps. The next step is to go to the fuse panel. I found the fuse panel located inside behind the passenger front kick panel. I started at the top and removed fuses one by one. I kept removing fuses one by one until the eight and a half amp battery drain went away completely. It was a 25 amp mini fuse. I went to the owner's van and looked up the location of the fuse. It was number 20 and it powers the door locks, lift gate, glass, and rear wiper motor. So I know when you're removing fuses, you know, you're trying to see what's causing the drain, right? But once you find one, it probably powers multiple things. So now you know it's at least one of those few things that is draining your battery. Here's a picture of the fuse box. Just looking, I think it was this one or this one, if I'm not mistaken, it was one of these two. I think it was that one, but anyways. So I went to the tailgate, I opened the tailgate and removed the panel. I could see the wiper motor and I touched it with my hand and it was hot. So the rear wiper motor was hot as a match. So that told me that there was some kind of resistance, obviously, somewhere. I tried to move the wiper with my hand and it would not move. If it would not move, then it will not park the rear wiper. Note, wipers want to go to the park rest position when not in use. You ever notice that? You're driving down the road, let's say you have your wipers on intermittent. A lot of times they don't all, not all the time I guess, but a lot of times they don't always go all the way down. They stop right here instead of right here. When you're in intermittent, or when it's going intermittent, right? But then when you cut it off, while you're out of the rain, you cut it off, and now they go down here, okay? So they want to park, they want to get into their spot. That's what the wiper motor, that's what the, the wiper motor kind of looks like right there. Conclusion, the wiper transmission was seized up. Apparently it's a common problem with these expedition. Uh, moisture gets into the transmission and makes corrosion, which puts resistance on the wiper transmission. This is what the wiper motor was getting, this is why the wiper motor is getting hot. So every 39 seconds the computer will send a signal to park the rear wiper. It will try to park for about 10 seconds and give up for another, for about 39 seconds and try again. I replaced the transmission, got the rear wiper working correctly and no more battery drain. And that's what the little wiper transmission, what I call at least a wiper transmission looks like. It may, somebody else might call something different. So, I probably spent, I don't know, an hour or two, you know, figuring this out. Uh, felt pretty proud of myself. Then I sat down at the computer and just happened to say, hey, you know what, I wonder, I wonder if there's any YouTube videos on this. You know, I wonder if there's any Google, if anybody's run this problem before. And sure enough, there's a million videos out there about how to replace your wiper transmission. So if I would have verified the complaint and gone and checked technical service bulletins, gone and checked Google searched it before I went and diagnosed myself, I could have saved myself a lot of time. But, oh well, you live and you learn. Current is expressed in amps, resistance is measured in ohms, good job. It is okay to repair air battery wiring, true or false. Current has to be flowing, perform a voltage drop test, true or false. 
true. In order to do a voltage drop test, you have to have a current. But if you're trying to measure resistance, then you need to have no current flowing. It's going to give you false readings. Okay? And when you do resistance checks, let's say there's a connector here. There's a connector here. You've got one wire in this connector, okay? When you're checking resistance, let's say this right here goes to a computer, or let's say this right here goes to, I'm just going to say the wiper motor, okay? Let's say, let's say the uh, wiper motor isn't turning on, and you're suspect, you want to test this wire right here to run between the computer and the wiper motor. I mean, we're, and we're talking like no matter how long it is, okay? What you're going to have to do is you're going to plug the, unplug the connector on each side. Go here. Go here and measure resistance. Okay? If you leave this plugged in and just try to back probe it, or the computer back is going to measure resistance inside of here and here, you're going to get false readings. Okay? You've got to unplug it. All circuits have some kind of resistance. If you have, let's say you hook this up, boom, boom and your screen says OL, that's open loop. That means that there's a break somewhere. Make sense? So in that case, let's just put a couple more connectors in here. All right, so let's say we have an OL. The next thing I would do is I would split the circuit in half. So I would take my test light and go from like here to here, okay? I'm not sorry, my test like my voltmeter, okay? If I still have OL, most likely all that right there is good, right? So now I'm gonna take my meter, I'm gonna run it right here, or let's just put it to the connector, okay? Now I'll read 0.8 ohms. Okay, so what I'm telling you right, if you get that reading, that means here and here is good. Now you know the problem lies between here and here. So now you want to move your test leads. Put your test lead here, and then I will go like right here. If it says OL, you know that from here to here is all right, the problem between these, does that make sense? And that's how you become an effective, uh, how you get more effective at diagnosing electrical. If you read a wiring diagram and you keep splitting the circuit in half and just keep going that half, okay? Because if you don't have to test half the circuit, well, you, you know, that's a good thing. It's time is money. All right, anybody got any questions, comments, concerns? No? No? Alrighty.